the seven-year peace treaty spoken by Daniel can be found in Islam? Is it coincidence? Hardly. After rising to power, and as a prelude to his invasion of Israel, the Antichrist is said to confirm a peace treaty with the nation of Israel for seven years. Quote, he will confirm a covenant with many for seven years, end of quote in Daniel 9.27. In context, this verse shows us that the Antichrist will confirm and not establish a peace treaty. As is commonly thought, people used to think that the Antichrist establishes a peace treaty. That's not what the text says. He could confirm a peace treaty such as Oslo or Saudi plan and review them. This is a pre-existing agreement that will be re-established with Israel for seven years. However, the Bible also reveals that after only three and a half years, the Antichrist will break this seven-year covenant. As we can see, Satan, through the Islamic prophecies, has set up Muslims of the world to receive the Antichrist as their Messiah, Mahdi. Islam's prophet Muhammad talked about the seven-year peace treaty of the Mahdi. He had stated that it will be a treaty that is done between a Jew from the tribe of Aaron, uh, who is Moses' brother, and will be upheld for seven years. Another hadith also speaks of the reign of the Mahdi in this way. Quote, he will divide the property and will govern the people by the sunnah, that is Islamic hadith, uh, of their prophet and establish Islam on earth. He will remain seven years, then die. The Muslims will pray over him. So the Mahdi will fill the earth with equity and justice as it was filled with oppression and tyranny, and he will rule for seven years. And that's the end of the quote. The Bible warns us regarding the Antichrist that by peace he will destroy many. Does that ring a bell? Who are saying that Islam is a peaceful religion? Had Western believers diligently read the scriptures, we would not be in such a mess. The East needs your help. We have millions of Muslims converting to Christianity. Many are awakening to the evil that Islam truly is. These converts can offer you much knowledge, yet they need your help. Christians suffer by the millions. My village in Bethlehem it is now virtually void of Christians. Lands have been confiscated, including my own. Sacred locations, including the Messiah's birthplace, have been desecrated. Egyptian Coptic Christians are daily persecuted. Their women raped, kidnapped. Peace demonstrators petitioning Israel always carry leaflets that say, things like stop the cycle of violence. Yet violence in the Middle East almost inevitably comes as a result of false treaties which are never kept. Instead, they are almost always a stepping stone to further escalate violence in what Muslims call hudna. Hudna is a term all Westerners must learn. After 9-11, Westerners learn the word jihad. Well, not exactly. They are still divided on whether the term means holy war against all things non-Islamic or an internal struggle with self-betterment. Even the Islamophilic scholar Reuven Firestone has acknowledged that dubious nature of the oral tradition upon which this alleged interpretation of jihad rests, this inner struggle. Its source, he, he says, is not usually given, and in, it is in fact nowhere to be found in the canonical collections of the Hadith. Although the word jihad standing by itself means struggle, what Westerners need to focus on when reading the Hadith regarding Muhammad's jihad is similar to the focus needed when reading Mein Kampf, or My Struggle by Adolf Hitler. Ask yourself, struggle with what? In time, those who are leaning towards believing that jihad simply means struggle within will understand. It will just take more lessons until they will see. But the word hudna needs to be understood as well. In the Muslim mind, hudna is an Arabic term for a truce meant to produce a period of calm with the enemy in order to gain concessions, regroup, 
rearm, and reattack at the appropriate time. This has been its purpose throughout Muslim history. Based on Islam's understanding of Muhammad's use of it, a hudna could last as long as 10 years. Take, for example, the Oslo Peace Accords. Arafat relied on the term when he spoke about his commitment in 1994 to the Oslo Peace Accords. At the mosque in Johannesburg just a month after the signing, Arafat declared, not realizing that he was being taped, that the accords were merely a way to facilitate his jihad against Israel. Later, when challenged about this, he wiggled out of it by declaring that he was using the term jihad in its most positive sense, a struggle against inner negative forces. So Arafat presented himself as a jihad fighter for peace. Even Faisal Husseini, one of the PLO's highest level spokespersons, clarified the meaning of the Oslo Accord to the world in an interview with an Egyptian newspaper. I quote, he said, had the U.S. and Israel realized before Oslo that all that was left of the Palestinian National Movement and the Pan-Arab Movement was a wooden Trojan horse called Arafat. They would never have opened their fortified gates and left it inside their walls. The Oslo Agreement or any other agreement is just a temporary procedure, just a step towards something bigger. Faisal continues, our ultimate goal is the liberation of all historic Palestine from Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. That means the annihilation of Israel. The story of the Trojan horse is synonymous to Islam's hudna. Hamas agreed to several ceasefires between 1993 and 2003, none of which, none of these agreements were honored. The West must understand these offers as mere tactical maneuvers to allow militant groups uh, time to live to fight another day. Even though it seems that Hamas might reject any peace plan, rest assured that in the near future they will. Yet again, it will be a sign hudna, not a peace treaty. But now you, my Western friend, know the difference. It will be yet another Trojan horse. I have stated this on record. So when it happens, you will remember what the West does not understand about Islamism is that jihad is very systematic. It has stages. If Muslims have the upper hand, then jihad is waged by force. If Muslims do not have the upper hand, in this case in the West, then jihad is waged through financial and political means. Since Muslims do not have the upper hand in America or Europe, they talk about peace in front of you while supporting Hamas and Hezbollah in the back room. The whole idea of Islam being a peaceful religion emanates from the silent stage of jihad. Muslim scholar Sheikh Qaradawi, probably one of the most prominent Sunni Muslim scholars today, taught Muslims this form of trickery at conferences all over the U.S. and in Europe. I have it on video. At one conference, Qaradawi used the example of Salahuddin, what you call Saladin. Saladin was asked to concede to peace with the verse from the Quran in, in chapter 8, verse 61. Quote, and if they incline to peace, then incline to it and trust in Allah. However, from Quran 47, 35, he replied, and be not slack so as to cry for peace, and you have the upper hand. In Islam, conceding to peace means that the Islamic ummah or nation is weak. But as soon as Islam becomes the stronger force, it switches into war mode and high gear. So to understand this whole concept, we must also go back to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. To understand it, I need to explain an essential bit of Islamic history known as the, this Treaty of Hudaybiyah. During the early years of Muhammad's small but growing movement, the Muslims were in conflict with the tribe of Quraysh, who were the guardians of the so-called holy city of Mecca. Muhammad and the Muslims had been kicked out of Mecca and were now living roughly 200 miles to the north in Medina. During those days, the various surrounding Arab tribes would make a yearly religious pilgrimage to the pagan shrine in Mecca known as the Kaaba. 
But because the Quraysh and the Muslims were enemies, and because the Quraysh were much more powerful than the Muslims, they would not allow them to make any pilgrimage. Then one night, Muhammad claimed to have received a revelation whereby he said that Allah told him that he and the Muslims would make the pilgrimage to Mecca. But as the Muslims were attempting to uh, sneak into the city at a place called the Spring of Hudaybiyah, they were intercepted by Quraysh troops. It was there that the men of Quraysh uh, disrespected and shamed Muhammad in front of his men. They also refused the Muslims entry into Mecca. However, they did offer the Muslims a very generous deal. This deal became known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Both parties agreed not to attack each other for 10 years. Because the Muslims were by far the weaker and smaller group, the peace agreement was clearly a generous deal on the Quraysh part. But Muhammad was humiliated and his Muslims were covered with shame. They were terribly embarrassed uh, that their so-called prophet had been treated so poorly and did nothing to respond other than roll over and agree to the treaty. They were also completely disillusioned because Muhammad had obviously prophesied falsely regarding the pilgrimage. But Muhammad's response to his followers was typical of a false prophet. He simply painted a new bullseye around his arrow. Muhammad argued that Allah had never said that the Muslims would make pilgrimage this year, but that they would simply make it uh, someday. Al-Bukhari, in fact, records this hilarious event when Umar said, I went to the Prophet and said, aren't you truly the apostle of Allah? The Prophet said back to him, yes, indeed. I said, isn't our cause just and the cause of the enemy unjust? He said, well, yes. I said, then, why should we be humble in our religion? He said, I am Allah's apostle and I do not disobey him and he will make me victorious. Uh, I said, didn't you tell us that we would go to the Kaaba? He said, yes. But did I tell you that we would visit the Kaaba this year? Omar should have walked away at that point. Knowing that his men were grumbling and that immediate action needed to be taken, Muhammad rose and the following morning claimed that Allah had sent down another revelation explaining uh, that what had happened was in fact a great victory. How is that a great victory? Remember that any time a, a pirate is allowed to live freely another day, this is considered a great victory. This pattern of behavior is typical among Muslims. Even today, after every terrible military failure, Muslims will still triumphantly declare their victory. The recent clash between Hezbollah and Israel is a perfect example. But beyond declaring his failure a victory, Muhammad also turned the event around by declaring to his men the, glad the gladdest tidings of his latest revelation. All of the treasures, the women, the children from the Jewish community of Khaybar would soon uh, belong to them all. The Muslims instantly became the pirates of the desert. Within only weeks of being humiliated, Muhammad began attacking and pillaging several very wealthy Jewish villages. The Muslims who participated in these attacks reveled in their newfound wealth as well as the many women and children that they took as slaves. Muhammad was also allegedly told by Allah it was okay to use the captured women as sex slaves and this law still stands to this day. When other non-Muslim Arabs saw all the Muslims enjoying their wealth and slaves, the new converts suddenly began to pour into this Nimrod's religion like a mighty river. In the immediate period after this, the growth and expansion of the young Muslim movement was staggering. Early biographers of Muhammad attribute this expansion directly to the period of peace that the Muslims enjoyed as a result of Treaty of Hudaybiyah. When the treaty was made, the Muslims were less than 1,500. But when, within a mere two years, the Muslim men alone were 10,000 strong. Between the Quraysh and the Muslims, the Muslims suddenly 
were the larger and more powerful group. So despite the 10-year peace treaty that Muhammad had uh, agreed to, it was time for the Quraysh to pay. Muhammad and his Muslims wasted no time in breaking their end of the treaty. They attacked Mecca and the power of the Quraysh tribe was shattered. The Muslims were now the undisputed rulers of both Mecca and Medina. The point, of course, in recalling all of this history is to demonstrate the certain fact that Muhammad was a brazen opportunist and a Nimrodian revolutionist. But he is also the supreme example for all Muslims today. As such, to this very day, Muslims do not view peace treaties in the same way that most people understand a peace treaty. To the Muslim mind, treaties are not binding agreements, but rather opportunities to grow stronger or by time or the, to appear peaceful while uh, preparing for a battle. But make no mistake, making peace treaties with the infidels simply for the sake of peace is never the ultimate goal. The only goal of Islam is victory over the whole world. If you don't believe that anyone could uh, be this blatantly subversive, then consider this. In May of 1994, Yasser Arafat addressed a group of Muslims in Johannesburg, South Africa. What Arafat didn't know was that he was being secretly recorded. At that time, uh, things were looking really good for the Middle East peace process. Many felt as though tensions were winding down. But Arafat revealed the truth when he spoke of the ongoing jihad to liberate Jerusalem. Those Israelis who had trusted Arafat's previous promise of peace and goodwill were shocked. But even more damning were Arafat's references to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, referring to the peace agreement that he had only recently made with Israel. Arafat said, I see this agreement as being no more than the agreement signed between our Prophet Muhammad and the Quraysh in Mecca. The Prophet had uh, been right to insist on the agreement for it helped him defeat the Quraysh and take over their city of Mecca. In similar spirit, we now accept the peace agreement, but uh, only in order to continue on the road to Jerusalem. Westerners always inquire and struggle to find moderate Muslims. Do they exist? If so, where are their Arabic websites? How many are there? If they exist, why are they only in English? Why do they only partially quote Muslim jurisprudence? If one studies Islam carefully, one would find uh, two sets of uh, codes some uh, abrogated Quranic verses and commands for peace used whenever objections against violence in Islam arise. Then you have uh, other commands exclusively for Muslims. Muslims believe that expansion through war is not aggression, but love, since only through Islam can we attain peace. In other words, we are invading you for your own ultimate good. Yeah, right. The resort to force to uh, disseminate Islam, at least in the view of Muslims, is not war, what they call harb, but rather they are seen as an act of uh, bringing non-Muslims into the house of peace through what Islam calls futuhat. Futuhat is the act of openings. You open the world for peace through Islam. That's how they interpret that. Ironically, Islam calls itself the house of peace, Dar al-Islam, even though the word Islam literally means submission. And it calls for non-Muslims, for the non-Muslim world, that is, who truly wants peace with Islam, the house of war or Dar al-Harb. In other words, Islam says to the non-Muslim world, because you are such terrible warmongers, we must attack and utterly conquer you. So who is ushering the apocalypse, Christians or Muslims? The Bible describes that in the last days, Israel will fight against a coalition of nations that are led by Turkey and Iran. In Zechariah 9.13, the Lord declares, I will rouse your sons, O Zion, 
against your sons of Greece, that is Yavan. In this passage, Israel is seen fighting against Ionia or Yavan. In several Bibles, this word is translated as Greece. But Ionia or Yavan was simply a province that was located in the west coast of modern Turkey. This is crucial because the clear context of this battle is the return of Christ. Quote, then Jehovah will appear over them and fight on their behalf. So in the end times, the time when Jesus returns, the Jews, or in this case Zion, will be engaged in a war with Turkey, Yavan. In Ezekiel 38, we learn that besides Turkey, Iran will also be a key player in the last days, assault against Israel. Quote, Persia will be with them with the shields and helmets. Persia is simply the ancient name for modern day Iran. We already see Iran today threatening Israel. What is so amazing is that Islamic tradition also contains prophecies that picture precisely these enemies waging war against Israel in the last days. The difference, as usual, is that in the Islamic account, the Turks and the Iranians are portrayed as the righteous and we are being led by the Mahdi while the Jewish people are, as usual, portrayed as the wicked. An Islamic prophecy speaks about an army of Muslims carrying black banners with the creed of Islam written across them. Quote, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is Allah's messenger. The black banner has always been the banner of jihad. In this tradition, the Muslims are marching from Iran and are heading towards Israel to take, to take Jerusalem for their Mahdi. After Muslims have conquered Jerusalem, the Mahdi is said to use the Temple Mount as his seat of authority from which he will rule over the whole earth. The Muslim scholar Abdul Rahman al-Wahhabi in the Day of Wrath states, the final battle will be waged by Muslim faithfuls coming on the backs of horses carrying black banners. They will stand on the east side of the Jordan River and will wage war that the earth has never seen. The true Messiah, who is the Islamic Mahdi, will defeat Europe, will lead his army of Seljuk Turks. He will preside over the world from Jerusalem because Mecca would have been destroyed. The Seljuk Empire were Turks that preceded the Ottoman Empire. It covered the region of Turkey, northern Iran, Syria, Iraq, southern Caucasus, and Azerbaijan. Many Islamic scholars believe that the Mahdi will lead an army of Turks and will rule over Israel. Expounding on the tradition of the black banners, the so-called moderate Sheikh Qabbani, the darling of many conservative Americans, states that the armies will come from the region of Iran. Hadith indicate the, that black flags coming from the area of Khorasan, that is Iran, will signify that the appearance of the Mahdi is nigh. Khorasan is in today's Iran, and some scholars have said that this hadith means when the black flags appear from Central Asia in, in, the, in the direction of Khorasan, then the appearance of the Mahdi is imminent. Do you see how the coincidences keep piling up? But with God, there are no coincidences, no accidents, and thankfully, no surprises. While the Bible prophesied thousands of years ago that the Antichrist would lead an army of Turks and Iranians, so also does Islamic tradition state that their messianic Mahdi would lead an army of Turks and Iranians against Israel.